guru, Andrea, Andrea Manalina, and I'm assistant vice provost in the graduate school. Um, I work to support graduate students and postdocs across disciplines. And I would also like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Eileen Dawn Alexander, also goes by Ida, um, colleague in the Center for Educational Innovation, Education Specialist, my uh, co-presenter today. And then we also have Dr. Amjan Mustayeva, who is our program associate in the graduate school and uh, working with a lot of initiatives there. So uh, welcome everyone. We've uh, decided to do a little different format for this session, which is we have asked all of you to view recordings and some resources that have been developed by our colleagues in the Center for Education and Innovation, mainly led by Dr. Alexander, um, on what we call pre-application stage materials. But uh, we will also just kind of give some uh, overview um, of those resources as well. And then we have questions that we've asked you to submit. We we'll also take your questions during this session. Um, so you have some time to think about some questions if you haven't uh, or didn't submit any. And uh, we'll take those as we go along. So right now I'll just um, turn it over to my uh, colleague, Ida, to start us off. Yep. And welcome all. And uh, please do use the chat along the way. Um, if you want to ask your question out loud, um, unmute yourself. You can also raise your hand um, if that's more comfortable for you as a way to enter into a conversation when you're ready to have uh, ask us a question. We have um, thought about the common documents during this pre-application stage. And there's sort of the CV right at the heart of it. It's not necessarily the main thing and that will be part of a faculty committee making a decision, but it's the base from which you can build your application materials. The cover letter will refer to the CV, so it doesn't have to carry all the weight of describing all that you do, um, but to be able for you to be able to highlight. The CV lets you talk about your teaching more generally and the places you were rather than requiring specific dates. The CV is a great place to list your references so that they're there. People don't have to ask for them. Um, and it also helps put in a context for you know, who you've worked with. And then there will be specialized documents that you will refer to that you'll be asked to create, maybe a syllabus that you'll be asked to submit or a research statement. Um, we don't have necessarily, uh, we, we don't have that research statement as part of our collected materials, but we're happy to take those questions as part of our teaching learning philosophy and open-ended question session that will come up. Again, the CV is a great starting place and uh, we'll use this organization um, in a little bit to walk through um, these common materials and see what questions you have, hear what questions you have. But Noor is gonna start us out with some of the questions that came in early. Yep. Thank you, Ida. Yep, sorry, whoops. <laughs> it's okay. Let's go back. There we go. All right. So one of the questions um, is about a person who is applying to a research uh, focused research heavy institution. Um, but however, as a last year doctoral student, my publishing record is weak and much of my research experience comes from my dissertation only. How do I overcome this weakness? So Eileen and I were talking about this and, you know, depending on your discipline, um, we have seen, and I personally have seen graduate students and postdocs put in their CV what's called um, works that are in progress. So if you have works that are under review, so they have been submitted to a journal or to a, a book publishing company and they're being reviewed. So they, there is no decision yet. So those are the you know, under review or pending, but there's also what we call works that are in progress that you are working on um, on your own, if you're a sole author or with co-authors, um, but it's not enough to just say I'm working on you know this um, manuscript. But if you can be as specific as you can about where that manuscript status is, like what stage, what what's completed, what's 
um, pending to be done. That will give the uh, search committee a little bit more confidence that if, you know, you're not having all these things that are in progress, right? Because, you know, sometimes you can just say I'm working on this, but, you know, some people may not actually be. So any kind of specificity around the timeline of, um, you know, where is that work um, in its progress would be helpful to a search committee. So maybe you're um, working on results or uh, whatever aspects of that. The other thing is to focus on what you plan to do, how you plan to research, what your research um, projects are and your publications for the position that you are applying for. So most research ones would probably have a research statement as required, like a, a specific um, mention of what you're going to do. And then not just say, I'm gonna research this, but then here's where I anticipate publishing the results of my work. So they see that maybe you have not had a lot of opportunity to publish as a grad student, but you do plan to do so as a faculty. And here's your, uh, here are the outlets that you plan to pursue. Any thoughts, uh, Eileen, on that? My cursor was hiding from me. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, just I'll add two things. One of the nice things about thinking about your CV is creating a digital version of your CV, which we can come back to more. So more and more people are going to be asking you for a URL for your, your, your um, application materials. So go with that, create it in Google Documents, because one of the things you can do is update the status of an article. So for example, I've been working with a former student who's now a professor and some of um, their students. And uh, just yesterday, we got notice that we have a publication date. So that's a new thing to add instead of saying, um, uh, you know, copy editing in progress in press, which was what we said before, because that's a solid specific stage. Um, and when you're working on something, they're always going to let you know at the publication place what stage it's at. So use their language. Um, and yes, the research statement, it's a great place to start um, noting what direction you're going to head in. And in a video that we have that you have access to, um, that's interviews with faculty about the job search process, one of the things they say is don't tell us only how you're going to do research linked to your dissertation. Show us your new direction. So that is really important in a context like this. What's your new direction? Where have you started? What's coming up in the future? Thank you. Okay. Next slide. There was also a question submitted about offer negotiation. So this uh, student asks, <clears throat> what aspects of an offer are negotiable and which ones aren't? Are there general guidelines about this or is it specific to the institution? So this is one of those, you know, depends, <laughs> it depends question um, and answer. Um, it is specific to the type of institution. So. Um, broadly, there's private versus public institutions. And with um, public institutions, the um, instructors and faculty may be on contracts, may be um, represented by a union. So they have like clear guidelines in terms of like salary and benefits, things like that. So you do want to know ahead of time what you're able to negotiate and what you're not when an institution um, gives you an offer. And you know, part of that you can also find out online with what kind of institution it is, which you probably already know as you're applying, and um, what's um, strictly uh, already set. And for private institutions, there's a little bit more flexibility. Um, so examples of things that you might be able to negotiate at a private institution, um, you know, a lot also, again, just depends on what type of private institution it is. Is it small liberal arts? Is it, um, you know, research? Is it uh, comprehensive? But salary, of course, everybody kind of starts there. Um, but other than salary, you say in addition to salary, you should also think about other aspects of being a faculty, which is the teaching load, 
if you are at a um, private liberal arts, how how much teaching can you negotiate? Um, you know, three three meaning three fall, three spring, or four three. You know, whatever the expectation is, and then see if you can um, negotiate a reduced load. If you're thinking about um, you know, wanting to do more research, if that is something that's accepted by the school. Now, one of the things that is sort of um, a misconception, I say this to students all the time on the job search at liberal arts colleges, is there is this perception that, well, I'm not going to do any research at, uh, you know, four-year liberal arts. But I have close connections with certain schools, the deans and the provosts there, and they tell me that they do expect some research from their faculty. So if you are someone, uh, especially if you're going to what, you know, what we call, um, you know, more uh, premier liberal arts where they do expect their faculty to do some research, you could uh, potentially negotiate your teaching load so that you can continue with your scholarly publications. For those um, in uh, STEM fields, startup uh, research funds for labs, equipment, um, graduate student, if it's a research one, you want to be um, sure that you have the facilities and the personnel to do the work that you need to do for your research. You might also think about junior sabbatical to research and publish. Um, again, depending on the kind of business institution you're going to, I've heard um, of some individuals being successful with that, um, taking some time to travel to do the research, do field work, all of that. Professional development funds, um, you want to know how much the institution um, allocates for faculty to continue to be active in professional associations, to travel for um, you know, presentations and such, um, to, to research. Um, if you are in uh, what they call spousal or partner hire, some institutions um, do commit a particular unit just to focus on hiring partners or uh, spouses of individuals that they are seeking um, after to, to join the institution. So um, you wanna know if that's a, a possibility, if there's a position for your partner or spouse um, at that institution. Some universities don't just focus on placing the spouse or the partner at the institution, but also in the area. So for example, if your partner or spouse is not in academia, but might be um, you know, uh, working for a nonprofit or industry or government, some institutions do have units in, in their HR to help partners and spouse find jobs within that region um, in other sectors, not just academia. Um, you also want to know if there is any support for um, housing, like to go look for housing. I had a student who asked for that. They were leaving Minnesota, going to, um, I think it was Georgia, and um, the department um, paid for the, the student and um, his uh, wife to look for housing there, the travel, the hotel and all of that, and also asked for um, moving expenses. Um, you also want to um, see if there is any support for accommodation in terms of if you have health um, or uh, access issues. You want to ask for those um, space. Like I have uh, a um, letter that I can present to my employer about my needs in terms of my workspace because I have um, issues with um, ergonomics. So wherever I go, I'm you know registered with the unit that allows you to have those um, accessibility and accommodations. So those are just some things that you need to think about. Um, depending again on uh, where you land with your um, application. Any additional thoughts, Eileen? I'll just add one thing as I advance this. If you feel like you want an answer or response, have a specific question, a center for teaching at the university that you're heading to, someone who works with graduate students, so someone who teaches in a preparing future faculty program, an international TA program, does workshops. Ask them. Make make a point when you're on camp in an on campus interview or you're um, doing Zoom interviews to ask them what they know. We can do things like, 
get a hold of a college and say, you know, I'm getting a lot of questions from my graduate students about how to negotiate for a job and what kinds of things are negotiable in your college. Can you give me some ideas? Um, it's pretty anonymous because I do work with graduate students. It's a question they're not surprised I ask. It doesn't reveal anything. And um, I can then pass along the information. And like Nuru, I try to keep up with what people are saying and, and learning. But a Center for Teaching is a great resource and a job search too for finding out about a uh, department's reputation, their ways of teaching, those kinds of things, and getting an understanding of the campus. And here's our next, whoops, next <laughs> submitted question for now. Yeah. So this student says, I've heard horror stories of applicants pouring their heart and soul into the application materials only to have been left in limbo for months before receiving a response. What is a reasonable turnaround time one can expect for academic jobs? So uh, again, this also varies um, by institution. And you know, I've just, uh, I mean, I've heard from students and postdocs that I've um, personally supported, but also you know, looked online to kind of see what you know people are saying and um, definitely uh, varies based on institution. So if you apply, um, I would say you probably wouldn't, you know, get a decline letter earlier than a month, so at least a month, but it can be a month to eight months or a month to a year, or unfortunately, like most people are finding out, you may never hear, you may not get any response whatsoever. Um, and so, you know, people say, well, that's very rude. I mean, people took the time and energy to apply and then to not even say, you know, thank you, but no. Um, but there are institutions that do not um, respond if you are not offered the position. So just be aware of that. Um, if you are selected for what's called a short list, which is uh, basically you will kind of go um, to the first round, you know, depending on how each institution defines short list. But let's for, for our argument, we could say you've made it um, to the first round of interviews, which usually are online. That's what the students that I've worked with say they, they get invited to an online interview. Um, so that could be about one to two months, maybe three for some, just depends on like how many applications they get, just, you know, who they have to vet things to. And then um, most likely, I'm hoping that most people probably get a uh, decline letter if you will not proceed to the campus interview, which is the next step. Uh, but again, you may not hear nothing at all. I've heard students hear nothing. They made it to the short uh, list, they interviewed online and then nothing, okay? Um, and then, so if you do um, get to be invited for a campus interview, that could be about one to two months after the um, online interviews and you you know, may get a response that you didn't um, get an offer or there might just be silence. But then after the campus interview, um, typically should could be one to two months or so. So it really just depends. But just know that most inst institutions from what I've heard and what I've seen um, should uh, be giving out offers about, say, you know, March, April at the latest, th thereabouts, or, you know, just varies a little bit, um, could be a little later, but um, most appointments would start like in August, um, just to kind of make sure that the new faculty has um, all things in place to start the fall semester. So there isn't really like a set, like it must be done this way. It just um, depends on how each institution does their search. Uh, I think the most important thing and what I've just kind of, you know, hearing and reading is do the best you can to apply. Um, don't sit around being nervous, you know, wondering what happened. You may not hear um, much, but you just move on and, um, you know, keep looking for opportunities. So, um, again, definitely not take anything personal. If you're not hearing back, you may not just be you could be just something, you know, the way the institution functions. So Eileen, anything to add? Um, 
There are some often back channel conversations for particular job posts or in particular fields in Discord and Slack. So you might ask around um, about those in the disciplines that you're in and see what people will point you to. They're pretty interesting um, because the folks who are in the same space where jobs are being offered often add pieces to those back channel conversations unofficially and don't hesitate emailing uh, something short and polite um, to the person who's your main contact. Um, you often get an email when your materials are received. That's a starting place for knowing who you can um, be in touch with. And if they aren't the person, they generally will let you know. Um, those um, short little emails, I think the guidelines Neuros put out here are really good for the follow-up timing too, to sort of say, um, I'm you know, looking at my calendar and making decisions. Can you tell me what your calendar might be for filling this post? Um, those kinds of things are good questions to ask. But now we're going to move into hearing questions from those of you who are here. And again, there's that reminder. I want to um, share this slide link with you. Let me go backwards for just a second so that you can have these slides, which include some resources also. So let me go into here and I'm going to put our slide link into the chat. Um, there's <clears throat> another supplement to the one pager, which is all over the place, uh, the one Nuru mentioned at the beginning. So we're going to take some time, see what kinds of questions you have for some of the individual documents. We'll start with a CV. We'll talk, hear what you have to say as questions about the cover letter and the learning teaching philosophy. And then we have open-ended questions for this period. That's our last half hour. Um, so we're going to dig in. And uh, again, use the mic, ask a question in the chat for each one of these particular areas uh, to let us know what questions you have as we refresh you about some of the basics. Um, and we'll just start with that CV. The materials and resources point out there are two kinds of CVs, static CVs and dynamic ones. This is my image and I think of a static CD as my playlist right now. It's on Amazon Music because it's consistent, easy for me to get to. Um, and, you know, I have like thousands of people listed there. Um, my own static CV is around 30 pages long. My dynamic CV, on the other hand, kind of like the playlist is much smaller. My dynamic CV, I just did a new one as I'm about to retire and I'm thinking about what I might want to do next. I gave myself six pages to um, showcase my interests and work with teaching and learning. And that's it as I look for consulting things. My dynamic CV is aligning with the kind of job, the kind of institution, the places that I wanna work. And also as a reminder, um, we have some resources in, in the, in the uh, CV resource, a reminder of some of the things you might think about to include in your CV listing, especially that static one, where you can go back to maybe, papers, research you did as an undergraduate, you might not include that when you apply for a particular position because maybe that undergraduate research no longer applies to what you're doing, but maybe it shows that you have uh, continually developed your understanding and depth of knowledge in a particular area. So again, the static has everything, including what I did, for example, in my undergraduate research. That's not in my dynamic one. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's a quick little look at some of the high points in our resources. And we have some questions showing up in chat. Um, <clears throat> and I'm just going to, I'm going to take them on and Nuru lets you join in as we go through them. How's that? I'll do a quick readout of them. Yeah. Um, Kara's asking, do you have a number of jobs you tell people to shoot for when they're applying? A more general question, and does this depend on the discipline? Um, my piece of advice is to apply for jobs that genuinely speak to you, that you think, I have an interest here, and here's how I could contribute to that department. And, and there's no specific number. Don't wear yourself out by doing 50 um, applications if your heart's not in 15 of those, because you're going to betray yourself about not being um, totally interested in, or um, don't think that it's just more practice. It's not. 
Um, your practice is in the first 10 or 15 that you apply for. So I encourage people not to wear themselves out by over applying because their heart's not in those um, positions. Um, and does it change based on discipline? You know, I think the biggest change is not so much discipline, but type of institution you're applying to. There aren't going to be very many jobs that are tenure track in a research one institution. They're going to be um, the kinds of positions that uh, people like me hold, the um, lecturer, um, teaching professor, um, educational specialist. And in that case, again, think about what kind of position it is and how much um, it meets your own needs. So if you see at a university you want to be at five positions and three of them really speak to your interests, send those out. Keep track of the other two, come back to them, know when their deadlines are, but put your energy into the first three that really speak to you. That's my general advice and what I hear from the faculty who are looking at all those applications who say, I can tell when someone's just churning out applications and that's not a helpful thing. Newer. Yeah, um, absolutely echo what Eileen is saying. Definitely remember to please tailor <laughs> your applications to each institution they are very you know different and they will know when you are putting out what they call a blanket application um have people who are familiar with the type of institution you're applying to look at your application materials um that's an issue for grad students and postdocs who want to teach at liberal arts because your advisors are not a, a liberal arts institution they know research one so you need to find someone who understands liberal arts schools and have them look at your materials. Yep. And Sarah has asked a question about determining if the postdoc or um, a term position will better qualify you. And, and a couple of things in that. Um, when you're listing your experience, say for teaching or research um, and setting out those kinds of um, experiences that you have, Again, go back to reading the job description. That's how you tell which one of those better positions you. So for a, a baccalaureate institution, a liberal arts institution, if you're going to be um, applying for a position at, say, McAllister, where, gradu where under undergraduate focused and they're aiming for graduate school, a postdoc is going to look really alluring to them and also to St. Thomas to take two local examples, because it's your way of demonstrating that you have done research, you've done independent research, and you've worked with a team. A term position, which whether it's a research one or a teaching one, is going to be as interesting at Hamlin and I would say Metro State, which isn't a traditional baccalaureate, but it's one of those comprehensives. Um, where it matters, those kinds of places, it matters that you have teaching experience and you can draw on research in your teaching and in your own work. So part of that is really what type of institution is it within the baccalaureate? Is it a high research institution, moderate research, St. Thomas, high research, McAllister, high research, Hamlin, not so much a high research. It's there, but it's not, a, it's a pretty much equal with teaching. So look at the position when you're thinking about that. Nuru, anything there? Shall I continue? Please continue. Okay, there's another postdoc question in here. Very grant or group specific. How do you begin your search and find people you are interested in working for? That is where networking matters. Um, I think that can be the most important thing. So think of two things. One arm would be, if you don't want to ask in your own department with networking, like who do they know? Who did they work with? Who did they come from? Maybe you're working with a colleague already who you really like their work and their interest. Ask them who they worked with. Ask them who they might recommend if they were looking for a postdoc now. If you're feeling like you don't quite want to reveal that in your own department, and there are reasons to do that, to keep it more to yourself, think of a parallel or a a related um, discipline that you could go to. So I have an interest in education. If I was looking at postdocs now, I um, have a social science background and I might look um, in my own social science field, but I'd probably go to education and talk to people there and find out who they've been excited by, um, what kinds of things. And the other network is people who are two to four years out of your program. 
where are they and who are they working with? So that thing of peers plus two to four can be really important for thinking through um, who are the people who might be good in doing this? Um, if you have target universities, most universities now have an experts database like the University of Minnesota does. Go to that experts database, type in what you're interested in, and then start to look at the names and the pages for the people associated with those pieces. Um, so that would be another postdoc related approach. Newer. Yeah, someone also asked about um, if you take a postdoc abroad, does that jeopardize <laughs> your chances of get, getting campus interviews? If you are um, stellar in your work, in your research, the institution really wants you, they will pay however much it costs to, um, you know, intrigue you to join their institution. That That's for any kind of position. So, you know, I would say just you know, make sure that you are doing the kind of research and publishing in the areas that um, you need to be if, uh, you, you know, you want to be recognized for that kind of work. And don't worry about, you know, whether an institution is going to um, pay for you to come um, from abroad. Um, another thing about um, postdocing is there are places, um, somebody already uh, listed places to find postdoc opportunities. Um, Typically, there are also in uh, Chronicle of Higher Education, um, Inside Higher Ed, Higher Ed Jobs, postdocjobs.com, things like that, that you can look. When I used to post for postdoc positions, we were recruiting postdocs to university. We use the Chronicle a lot and uh, inside, inside Higher Ed. So um, definitely look around for opportunities. But like Eileen said, networking is going to be a big part of that as well. Yep. And I want to call attention to chat where um, you, there are some suggestions also for where to look for postings um, when you're in the postdoc or job um, search mode. Um, one last question here, and then let's go into the next part and see what your next questions are. And if you want to repeat a question because we missed it, feel free. Um, this question is, any advice on how job market materials are ranked in terms of importance by hiring committees? What materials should we spend the most time working on? I'm going to use that as my transition to the cover letter, because that really is the place to spend the most time. Um, it's not unusual now to hear a hiring committee say, it's the cover letter. And um, the, the CV matters, again, it informs the cover letter. Your cover letter pulls together all the materials you might be sharing if you're asked to share more than a CV or a cover letter. Um, it's the leading part. Leonard's not wrong in this. Um, your CV is your credentials, but your letter explains them. It's your chance to show people how they fit together to make you the colleague who can come in and do the particular work for the position that's being offered. So in that sense, the cover letter um, is what the search committee is going to be looking at. The CV, they'll take a look at to see how it backs it up. And as you illuminate particular things, they'll go look to see things. But that first glimpse of the CV is going to be by people who are making sure you meet all the qualifications that they want in the job. So there are um, requirements and then they're desired. Um, they'll look to make sure you hit all the requirements and they'll flag the ones that go beyond and, and go into the category of desirable things that would be nice to have. Um, and the search committee often is not the group that's doing that. That's often taken care of in an HR office. So again, the cover letter is a chance where maybe you've been by the HR office looked at as, yeah, they meet the, you know, the requirements, the basic things, but your letter might say, I go beyond that here's where I meet those other requirements. So make sure you address those kinds of things in your cover letter. It's your lead. It's the thing to pay attention to. It shows that you've done your research on the institution, that you've really looked at the job post. You've done some careful composing. This is new, we're talking about tailoring. There's a different letter you're gonna write for a community college. And most jobs are at community colleges, comprehensive and baccalaureate, not at research one. So for most cover letters, you're not going to lead with your dissertation. You're going to lead with the things the job post highlights. Write to your audience as a future colleague. That's an important piece of this, where you're um, not speaking as the graduate student to your advisor. You're speaking as their future colleague and a peer. Maybe you want to think of yourself as a junior peer. But again, you're speaking to them as a future colleague. 
And when you do send it, be sure to um, check out things about how to write an accessible letter um, or to write an accessible document. And I will include a link in a bit to the seven core skills that talk about using headings and bullet points and how to create white space. Committees are reading things on a screen. You want it to be accessible to a visual scan. You want it to be accessible to assistive technology. And you want it to be accessible to older eyes because yes, that's who's reading your job applications, people who have um, uh, eye strain. So you wanna think about those things um, to demonstrate that you, you know about the human beings who are reading your letter. And then this last thing, and let's see what more questions you have on cover letters and other things is <clears throat> really think about how you align with a department. So when you say you're happy to apply for a position, you're happy to apply for this position because these shared interests and these shared missions appeal to you as a candidate, as a person looking for a next position, looking for your place to work in the university. Um, so there are different things. Again, if you're going to a liberal arts, approach to teaching is really going to matter where publications and research might matter, will matter more in a research university. Um, a couple of my friends who are deans at community colleges and comprehensive universities say that they pretty much put aside any letter that opens with a dissertation because they don't understand the institution that they're applying, that they're making an application to join. So that would be a, a first consideration there. All right, Nuru, you're nodding. You've heard that too. Don't tell me about your dissertation if. <clears throat> so let's see. Um, other questions that you might have about the cover letter. Um, again, add some questions to our chat and we will take them on. And Nuru, I'm going to invite you to see if there's something you want to add to. Yeah, the, um, the cover letter you know, is telling your story. That's something that uh, a colleague uh, mentioned in addition to what we'll, we'll cover in a little bit. Eileen will um, walk us through the you know, teaching statement or philosophy, but, you know, basically pulling together all the materials, creating a picture of who you are um, as a candidate, as a, a you know, future colleague, and just to really tailor that very well. Uh, we do sometimes have panels of, Deans um, in the Twin Cities areas, Deans of Hamlin, um, you know, McAllister, St. Thomas, for example, and they tell us, you know, I just distinctly remember one of the deans saying, you know, tell your graduate students and postdocs to learn how to write cover letters by knowing the kind of institution they're applying to. Like, it's very clear they weren't interested in St. Thomas or St. Kate's because they talked about their dissertation. And it's not that these institutions don't you know, value um, research, but not at the level of research one. There's a reason why they are a four-year teaching institution. So uh, please make sure to tailor your um, application to the institution. And Kristen's added a question here about specific length for cover letters to keep in mind and are headings okay? Um, so, I, I have recently been reading about this because there's a uh, um, as they're taking on a more central role, and some of that we have an it depends section coming up about things related to AI and inclusion, and and the ways that you, many states don't allow us to ask questions about inclusion as part of hiring anymore, but still that need for having teachers and researchers who understand that is there. So the conversation has been two to three pages in these circumstances. Um, you have teaching and research experience that's deep and deep in uh, quality, quantity, and ties to what they're asking for. Um, so you want to address that. You don't have to say everything. But you do need to sort of think about the buckets, the clusters of things that you might be doing that are related to teaching and research and, and providing leadership on the campus that you're coming to because of the past. So that's a lot to cover, those three roles for faculty, and they're probably going to be um, things that are addressed in the job statement. So that's really important. And think of that last page two or page three as the transmittal information. Here's my phone number. Here's where to con you know. Here's where to contact me. Um, maybe that's where you include your references. 
Number one thing that I always tell people who are writing more than one page, and you should write more than one page, and I'll come back to that in a minute, is at the end of each page, make sure that the sentences at the end is compelling and it isn't completed until they turn the page. Make them turn the page. Make them want to turn the page. And most people, when I talk to them who are in search committees, they are happy to read into page two. And then they start to realize, oh, they're telling me how to find them and I'm done. And they might not read that part, but later when they want to find you, they know where to get it. They don't have to go to your CV. They've got your cover letter right on top. They've maybe marked it up with some questions. Um, one of the things I think is to say never do a one page cover letter unless it's specifically specified what you're to address and that you're to do it in one page. Both Newer and I hear from people that say, when I get a one page letter, I don't believe they are know themselves well enough and they're a good enough advocate for themselves. And I start to doubt that they're an appropriate candidate for this job because they haven't made the case to me. Um, so one page can actually be a harmful thing. Again, think about it. Um, and never single space, Sarah. Um, always space and a half. Um, you can do more than space and a half, um, but you can do double. But we recommend space and a half because it's easier on the eyes. And again, you want people to be able to move through this with a visual scan that's comfortable. So one inch margins, absolutely. I hear this regularly when I'm on committees with people from all age groups. Um, uh, the earlier question was about headings. Yes, you can do headings. You don't have to run them necessarily as headings. Maybe the first word in the paragraph is two words is teaching experience bolded and with a colon. The bold signals for visual scan that you're changing the focus. The colon signals to someone who's using assistive technology that you've just included a subheading without necessarily making it an official one. So space and a half, one inch margins, page numbers, if it's more than two pages, do that. Um, top of the page is better than bottom of the page. And yeah, make it visually interesting to read. Newer, anything you want to say with that? No, I think we've covered it. Um, just Taylor, Taylor, Taylor. <laughs> Please. Yep. And and sometimes the tailoring is small when you write those base letters. If you've got a liberal arts letter, um, I encourage people to figure out like five places where they can say specific things about the job. And then there are some things that they can do that's from in in a consistently in the letters to that type of institution. And you should mark those places where you're gonna change things up on your base copy in a different type style or a different typeface. I use red so that you don't accidentally say the wrong school when you send a letter. And yes, that happens. All right, as we're coming into this last part to think some with you about teaching and learning philosophies. Increasingly, these are, um, being asked for after the first round and or you're being asked to address it as part of your letter. Hence, sometimes that two to three pages. Um, and that's a part of you know writing a letter or a learning philosophy, write in the first person, address your beliefs. Um, and, and when you're talking about how you approach teaching, don't diminish somebody else's approach. So if you're talking about research-based teaching that you do that includes active learning, really engage small groups, uh, making room for accessibility, don't disparage someone who traditionally lectures because they might be on your search committee um, and you don't want to um, do that. So talk about what you do um, and why you've built that practice and how it supports learning and how it helps you to be the teacher you want to be. So that's that anchoring it to your discipline and to research related to um, inclusive teaching and learning. This is a place where you can address those kinds of things with a range of students you might um, offer or you might be working with. Um, think about specific examples of practice. You can draw on experience. And if you don't have experience, maybe you are in a preparing future faculty course and you can talk about ideas you developed there as part of writing a syllabus or you were at a workshop and you can uh, you use that to think about how you would teach in the discipline and department you're moving into. So always with practice examples. And again, the resource that's in there for a um, 
a, a module that you can walk through and see a, a, the evolution of some uh, teaching philosophies is really good for getting at the examples of practice. And then we have a submitted question here, and um, um, then we'll take some more of your questions in chat. Nuru. Yep. Oops, so <laughs> it's okay. Um, so the question was, how should we prepare a teaching statement when applying for research-oriented faculty jobs at uh, R1 institutions? So um, there are different uh, environments or venues for teaching. So if you are especially in uh, STEM or STEM related field, you might have um, teaching opportunities in labs or field environments. So out in the field doing research and you're teaching them how to do their research, for example. So focus on um, the kind of teaching, different types of teaching that's done in your field, in the institution that you're going to um, apply for. Okay. So understand that not all teaching is you know, primarily in a uh, standard classroom. Um, also, you can show how your research informs your teaching. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes you can also be um, vice versa. Um, we've included a, a resource from the American uh, Psychological Association. I'll put it in the chat. What I really liked about this um, document is how you know they they give you the um, teaching statement and then they highlight what the person is doing to make it research focused so um, you know at your leisure look at that and get an idea of how you talk about teaching in a research-based um, institution and the idea is to not let them feel like teaching is not important or it's like a second class, but how teaching is connected to research and research is connected to teaching, okay? So um, teaching is valued at um, some research institutions. It, it just depends on how you couch it in terms of the value of um, inclusive and effective pedagogy to help students think about their research. Uh, in a way that the institution wants them to. So a part of, of do, doing good research is having someone teach you how to do good research in the way that the institution expects. So there's an opportunity for you to combine teaching and research and that connection. Eileen, thoughts? I, I'm good with that. So let's hear if you have um, any uh, teaching learning statement questions or maybe research statement questions. We could feel some of that as well here. Again, research statements are often like teaching learning statements in that you don't get asked for them until later, um, mm -hmm. like maybe after a first interview. Okay. 500 word limit on teaching research statements for being brief but effective. Oh, yes. Um, as someone who reads them, I love them. As someone who writes them, I hate them. Um, uh, two things that have helped my students and when I teach the teaching and higher education courses, um, one is that I ask them to write a letter that's just to some future self about learning and one that's about teaching and to do them separately and in you know, different settings and to maybe not necessarily do them as a document, to do an infographic, to think of how you'd present it if you only had five slides, or even more drastically, if you only had three slides to talk about all your ideas about learning and all of your ideas about teaching, just sort of to be generative, but also winnow that, to really move it down. And that can give you those subheadings that you can use I think this is a place with a 500 word limit where subheadings can be especially helpful um, so that you can be directing people's attention. Um, and one of the other things that I've heard from my students who've asked this is that they have said some of those general things like um, using the three slide idea or the infographic idea to generate it, to lay out their basic principles and then show one have one or two paragraphs, depending on what's left over, that show those principles in practice in two different 
um, aspects of the same course or, or in a grad course and in an undergrad course. So again, practice gets in there, but what I've watched people do fairly successfully is lay out the principles and then address the practice because that helps you from saying too much about any one of them. You know, you can only make several points about the principles, maybe a half of 150 words, maybe just 50 words on each of the key principles you want to highlight. But then you have that room to do some practice examples, um, some specific scenarios, I would say, um, can be really helpful for that. Nuru, have you heard things on being brief but effective? <laughs> um, you know, less is more. Uh, absolutely. I think having just really sitting down and saying what's just fluff, what's not adding value to, you know, the 500 words and just really prioritizing the message that you want to send. So if any of you are familiar with the three minute thesis competition, mm -hmm. uh, which is coming up in November, by the way, make sure you attend if you're interested in how to have succinct, um, you know, effective communication. Um, I work with grad students to help them think through what can you cover in three minutes that's significant, but um, also uh, easy for people to understand who, who are not experts in the field. So just prioritizing what are the main um, points that um, you want, you know, people to make sure they know about your work. Um, we also just want to make sure we're good on time. So um, some more questions. Yes. Um, and I want to amplify the, um, the three minute thesis, five minute thesis, this, I believe um, there are some essays out there that are good models that are under a heading of this, I believe. And also PBS does my brief but spectacular take on things. And they're also really good short models to look at. Mm -hmm. There's uh, There are two questions here and I'm gonna use them to transition into a couple of things we have <clears throat> that are our it depends section, which is next. Um, <clears throat> so uh, one of them is research is not directly related to my teaching. How do I reconcile the two of them? One of those things is to talk about how your interest in your inquiry and your ways of approaching your research with enthusiasm and um, interest and care is, uh, and, and if you're going to bring students in, how you do that when you're mentoring students, but also how you encourage and mentor students to think and care and delve in and follow their curiosity in similar ways on different topics in another classroom or in another class setting. So it's that quality of care and concern and creativity and enthusiasm in your research. And how does that shape what goes on in your teaching? Because we do want people to be creative and caring and concerned, thoughtful, reasonable, kind, and sincere in both of those areas. Um, and how it benefits learners or a public, um, in the public for research, maybe learners as your public in a classroom, to, to be able to um, practice those skills and qualities, whatever the subject matter is. <clears throat> and then Carrie, you asked the question about starting to outlaw DEI offices and whatnot. How do we recommend to doing that? And anticipating that question, we put in two things here. One is generative AI is starting to come out as a question that people get asked often in the interview stages. But also that could come out in a job call now to be thinking about academic integrity and inclusion and accessibility are still probably going to come out. They might be worded differently, however, um, and it might be about supporting challenges students face. So our answer is it depends. And I put into the, into the resources here, into the notes field, the links to a recent piece that I have here on the screen it's really good for thinking about how to address this specifically. And um, these the two authors of the piece are at the same university, but they disagree about the value and benefit of diversity statements. So what they came together to talk about was realizing that they still want and always will want teachers to address the barriers that students face. And it is based on biases about race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, class, and disability and the challenges that can come with um, various identities, with uh, transgender identity, with neurodiversity, being a neurodiverse person, being a, a disabled person, um, which is what I call myself, or those other reasons. It's because maybe they don't share the same background as the schools and their first generation. So they still want people to be aware of 
the very broad range of students who are coming into the classes. And in that breadth of student diversity, still needing to hire faculty and staff who know that one size does not fit all, it's not gonna serve the most vulnerable students, and wanting professors who will meet students where they are, as they say, right there in the middle. Where are they and where do we want them to be and how do we support them in getting there? We want employees who are aware of the barriers and are empirically grounded in strategies for reducing those barriers and meeting those needs. And for me, that comes back to knowing the research and talking about how you use research supported strategies. So if you're in STEM, um, investigate um, VG Sathy and Becky Hogan and what they say about teaching and learning or Brian Dewsbury. Um, NIST, uh, which I will put a link to in here, is a National Institute for Scientific Teaching, has regular conversations about this, and they strategize on these things. If you're in the humanities, again, those resources from Becky Hogan, uh, VG Sathy, um, Mays Imad, and Brian Dewsbury, they're like the four best people if you're going to read something that's beautifully written and specific in principles and practices that you go to. Because the bottom line is they still want faculty and staff equipped to support demographically, neurologically, and culturally diverse student body. You just can't say perhaps the word inclusion when you're talking about this in a cover letter and a teaching philosophy, or you can because that's the language that they're asking for. So job descriptions, job calls, job posts are, I think, really important for thinking about this at the moment. Um, and <clears throat> waiting in some ways for the question to come up can be a strategy as well. I'm going to go backwards because I want to come to this generative AI. Um, my colleague Claire Bright and I have been talking to our colleagues. Claire is uh, junior faculty level, I'm um, senior faculty level in what we do in our time in our career. And so we've been asking the question about generative AI. Um, two questions. Um, one is, are you asking people about it? Are you getting asked about it when you go on the job market? And the answer is yes. I want to know how you would handle it, approach it, um, control it, use it, what might be your policies, but they also want you to certify that you have not used, this is happening, not as often, but they may want you to certify that you have not used generative AI in any form to create your application materials. So think very carefully about that. Um, I am a proponent of using AI as a brainstorming, as an organizing principle. It helps with my particular learning disability to have it, have it brainstorm with me, summarize things that I'm trying to figure out and there are human beings who know those same materials um, or to organize things. So I do that. And I could say I've never used uh, generative AI to write my materials for a course. That's true, but that doesn't mean I haven't used them. So it's a really important period, both for generative AI and inclusion and accessibility. And it might be that accessibility is a way to talk in some of the um, job calls. I've been seeing that word come up more. Part of that is realizing since we started the lockdown, how important it is for students to have access to course materials. Um, so that's our ending point um, to say it all depends. We do have some slides in here for you to follow up on later about what our colleagues have said that they are looking for when they're on a search committee and it's disciplinarily organized. So Nuru, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Eileen. Just wanna say related to, um, you know, states that outlaw DEI, I think one of the things that you could um, really communicate in your cover letter teaching philosophy, diversity statement, if they're asking for anything, is to let them know that there is no such thing as like a, even, you know, a monolithic group of um, people in the US or in the world, even within diverse community, there is still diversity. So what I like to tell my grad students and postdocs is to make sure they understand that you are going to approach your teaching, your research by treating students as individuals, right? The individuals that they are and not um, having expectations that, um, you know, students who think alike, look alike, whatever are going to be the same. There, There's lots of diversity within diversity and 
part of what we do when we talk about inclusivity and inclusion is to treat people as individuals and meeting where your students, uh, your students where they are and treating them as um, you know, individual human beings with all the needs and support that you can provide each student. Okay, I think we're good. Um, if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to Eileen or myself. Um, thank you so much for coming. We know that you have so many other things that could compete with your time, but we're glad that you are here. And please don't forget about the next um, workshop, part two of this, which is for what we call post um, application. So we'll talk more about the uh, interview process. Now, if in the past students were like, well, I don't even know if I'm going to get an interview. Um, we believe you should prepare anyways, regardless of where you are mm -hmm. in your graduate degree, in the application process, you should know what the expectations are for the campus visit, the job talk, um, those sorts of things. Just have a complete picture of what the whole job search, academic job search looks like. Okay, any last comments, Eileen? Nope, I'm good. I'm just reading the chat, which says, you know, when are we, when will we have access to the uh, materials? And the answer is there. So you will have it through gears soon. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you, I'm John. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.